to Beauty and the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Katherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's episode is a very special interview with Dr. George Batar, and he is a board-certified plastic surgeon. He's also founder and medical director of Batar Cosmetic Surgery Institute, and he's got two office locations, one in Fairfax and one in Manassas, Manassas, Virginia. And in case you don't know, it's in the Washington, D.C. area, which is super competitive. Now, interestingly enough, he came to this country from Lebanon when he was 16 years old. And I'd love to hear more about that as we talk today. Now, Dr. Batar managed to receive a medical degree from George Washington University School of Medicine, where he now serves as assistant clinical professor. He did his general surgery at the Albert Einstein Medical Center of Philadelphia. He did his plastic surgery residency at the University of Virginia plastic surgery program. And then he went above and beyond and he received additional training with prominent cosmetic surgeons in Rio de Janeiro, Bel uh, Melbourne, Johannesburg, and Beverly Hills. Now, he then launched his own plastic surgery fellowship program that was endorsed by the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, otherwise we always call it ASAPS, and it is only one of 26 practices in the entire U.S. that has that type of ASAPS endorsement. That's a big deal. He's received numerous honors and awards for his research. He's a speaker and member of several medical societies, and he does medical missions and volunteer work in the U.S. and abroad. Now, if that weren't enough, he has a beautiful wife, and we'll talk about her later, and he's got two great kids, and he's an artist focusing on watercolors and photography that you can see on his website, but I'm not going to tell you that right now because then you're all going to go to the website. So I'll tell you that later and I'll put it in the show notes. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Batar. How are you doing today? And did I leave Kevin, anything out? Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor and privilege. You know, we've worked together before at conferences in our own practice where you came and helped us doing things up. So it's, uh, it's so much fun to be here with you and to, uh, you know, share some of our uh, experiences with your audience. Thank you so much. Now, of course, there's only one conversation going on right now, and it will be for the near foreseeable future, and that's COVID-19. Can we get an update on COVID-19 and your practice and where you're at with that right now? Sure. I mean, I, I think that in the Washington, D.C. area, I'm happy to say that as of the time we're doing this uh, podcast, the numbers are not uh, stable. They're still rising, but they're rising in a very, very slow uh, incline. So my feeling is if we have not peaked, we're close to peaking. Uh, the governor of Virginia, where I'm at, has agreed to open up this area on May 1st to, uh, for surgery. So we have been doing surgeries in the last week in a limited fashion. Uh, he agreed to open up the offices of non-essential medical practices, which a cosmetic surgery practice is not essential uh, on uh, May 15th. So we're going to be opening up shortly after that. Uh, but we're really never closed, Catherine. We have patients that we've operated on, so we are doing post-ops, we are seeing patients who need to be seen. Uh, we have some of the staff members taking care of patients who uh, need prescriptions, uh, have questions to be answered, have upcoming surgeries that need to be pre op uh, so although we have slowed down our practice a lot, but we never closed. And where does the med spa fit into this? Are you able to do so, injectables and lasers? You know, no, we haven't yet. I mean, as of uh, March 20th, when we closed, we haven't done any injectables uh, yet because, you know, the injectables and any type of skin care has a pr close proximity between the patient and the provider. Uh, so we're waiting to... Uh, you know, we're opening back up uh, close to May 15. We're probably going to open up on May 18, which is a Monday. Uh, but then we're going to have more uh, protective gear. We're going to have masks. We're going to have gloves. We're going to have patients being put in rooms and, and spaced out. So we're working out a whole new system of practicing medicine, unfortunately. But we need to do it for the safety of the staff and the patients. Speaking of staff, by the way, you have a pretty darn big staff, and we'll talk more about them later, but right now, how do you handle that? Well, you know, I have to say that we always say in our practice that we may have over 20,000 patients, but we only have 27 staff members. So our staff members <laughs> are very valuable to us. And, uh, you know, they're like our family away from home. And 
my wife is the medical, is the executive director of the practice. I'm the medical director. So between her and I, the staff has become our second family over the years. Um, you know, obviously it was very painful for us to have to furlough a lot of them when we had to close our practice. We had no work for anybody. And, you know, it was just uh, by the orders of the governor, we had to close. And now slowly, slowly we're bringing people back. So it's very exciting. It's very uh, rewarding for us to see them back. And we're, we're happy that, um, you know, they were able to survive the last month. It has been tough, but, you know, they were able to do what they had to do to, uh, you know, survive. Now we're bringing our patients back slowly for the ops. We're doing a lot of virtual consults, a lot of virtual post-ops, a lot of virtual pre-ops but there are certain things that you need to see people in the office for. Like if somebody needs to have breast augmentations, they need to come and try on implants. You cannot do that virtually. Uh, mm -hmm. If I need to do any type of rhinoplasty surgery, I need to examine somebody. And we're being very careful with the gear, with testing people. Uh, but this uh, hospital has given the green light to open for rhinoplasties next week, and we're planning on doing them. Uh, so, uh, you know, the staff is essential in terms of keeping the uh, patients and the practice sort of um, on common ground. Uh, a question about the staff. Did you have any issues? I've been on a lot of the medical uh, webinars and uh, the legal was on there and they were talking about what if staff doesn't wanna come back? What if they're not comfortable with the safety of the practice? How do you handle that? Because I didn't see a good solution for that. You know, I feel that it's our responsibility as the practice owners to make it as safe of an environment as possible. There are some people who are, you know, by nature risk takers. Right. There are some people by nature are, who want to take zero risks. And there are some staff members who probably are influenced by their husbands, their wives, mm -hmm. and their parents to say, don't go to work. So there are lots of variables. I think on our end, what we can do to mitigate uh, the risk factors is to create a safe environment, to decrease the load of people coming into the office. Uh, there are some staff members who can do virtual consults and virtual uh, patient uh, encounters that we're gonna keep them doing it virtually, such as our patient care coordinators. You know, we've learned a lot in the last two months about virtual consults and how efficient it can be and the fact that a lot of the things that we did by bringing patients in the office may now be able to be replaced by a virtual consult. Um, and quite frankly, interestingly, our rate of bookings for virtual consult is close to 100%. I, yeah. I don't want to jinx myself, but people who book uh, virtual consults are booking. And I think the reason is is because the ones who do go on virtual consult are serious. They're not uh, doing it for fun. They're doing it because they want to have surgery. They understand the risks. They have the finances. And so our staff is very happy to help them. And because they're motivated, we're able to do a lot virtually than before we had to do in person and hand-holding. Are you charging for the consult? We do. We charge for the consult. Uh, I, they can call our office and our staff can give them the financial information. That probably helps too that you're, um, during the COVID-19 crisis, I was recommending that you just, you just build a list right now and build your brand and let anybody talk to you. But now that things are settled, I would say now it's time to go back to um, charging for a consult, virtual or live, because you can't afford the no-show rate. I mean, you know, uh, we, we were charging before for regular consults. I didn't see a reason we, that we should change our habits in virtual consults, we're still giving the patients our time, we're still giving them our expertise, we're still giving them our uh, know-how, we're showing them what we'll do for them, we're giving them valuable advice. So um, I, I feel that uh, if, if they are serious, then that should not be a big deal to them. If they're not serious, they probably uh, will not come to a virtual consult in the first place. All right, um, I got a tip from Rima, your lovely wife. Um, the platform that you're using, it's a, it's a nice, easy platform. It's called Doxy.me or something. Yes, Doxy.me. And, yeah. you know, I, I learned about that about two months ago, and we started using it. The nice thing about it, it has a virtual waiting room. Waiting so you can room. see who's waiting. You, have to, you can have the patient care coordinator or the nurse, depends on if we're doing a consult or a uh, follow-up. But you have one of the staff members there. You have the patient and myself or Dr. Lickstein, my uh, partner there. 
Um, you have the uh, other patients who are in line. They understand when their time is going to come because they're going to be in the waiting room. You can show them before and after photos. You can show them, um, you know, you have a nice, uh, very, um, I should say, clear screen that if I want to raise my iPad and show them things on my iPad, I can. Uh, we can give them virtual consents to sign uh, through it. So it really does a lot, and it's not that expensive. There's like a $35 to $50 mm -hmm. a month version that you sign up on, and you can upgrade it so you can have a little bit more, um, you know, more bells and whistles at a little yeah. bit of higher rate. But as far as I'm concerned, it's been very effective in terms of having the patients in the comfort of their own home, my staff member in their home and myself in my own home talking about what we would normally have done in the office. You know, the patient, if I'm doing a, a breast augmentation consult, they can just lift up their shirt. I can examine them. If we're doing a face consult, it's very easy to see. Um, if I'm doing a rhinoplasty consult, you know, if they say they're having difficulty breathing, then I know they're going to probably need some type of airway procedure. And when I go back to the office and examine them on the pre-op, which I will, because I never want to operate on anyone after just having seen them in a virtual consult. I have to see them in person, you know, call me old fashioned, but virtual can only go so far. You need to be in the same room with the patient. You need to gain the trust of that patient. They need to know that you're serious enough and they, that you care enough about them that you sat down and talked to them and answered their questions face to face, which is what we're going to do. Uh, but for all those reasons, I think virtual consults are probably going to be here to stay. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we are going to uh, see a change in the way we practice medicine based on not only COVID, but on companies that do virtual uh, consults and videos upping their game because now they realize there's going to be a lot more demand and things that were difficult to do or more cumbersome are going to become more streamlined and easier to use. What I don't want to gloss over are those two big um, features that Doxy has that Zoom, like what we're doing, we're using Zoom platform, I always have, but I don't have a waiting room. Doxy has a waiting room for you because what happens is um, everybody has the same login. So a patient could have jumped in on a Zoom call while you're still on a call with, with That's somebody. That's a good point. That's ridiculous. And most of you were not doing virtual consults and converting. You were just doing virtual consults and saying, okay, like there was no closing end to it. And with Doxy, you literally can have them signing forms if you want, like yeah, that's yeah, amazing. I think that's, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head, I think, because I have a lot of international patients. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have patients from Saudi Arabia, from France, from Beirut, from Nicaragua. You know, you we used to use uh, virtual consults, uh, you know, uh, like uh, WhatsApp or FaceTime uh -huh. or- um, Skype. Skype Zoom, or all those Google, things. Google, go to webinar. Google would call me on, you know, uh, Instagram, on uh, Facebook. I mean, whatever they could get their hands on, but it was not professional. I mean, the way I looked at it was in just a way to keep the interest of the patient right. in the practice, but that was more like a um, stepping stone. Now, with what you do with Doxy is the real consult. I mean, you know, I'm booking patients as soon as I hang up. They go to my patient care coordinator, they give them the pricing, they give them the, so, I mean, we're very busy. We're, we're you know, with the, with the restrictions we have in the hospital, we're booking a lot of patients. So, you know, we're running out of space. So if patients want their surgery, they want it right now, and they want to recover during this time of COVID, then they better book soon. Right. Um, I really, I'm glad that you have a, in, um, a, what's called embraced virtual consults. I don't think, now that we let that out of the box, I think it's gonna become mainstream. I think many patients are gonna demand it because it's more convenient for them and for you, but it's, I mean, a busy person, I would do a consult any day virtually, then go get in the car, schlep over there in traffic. I, I love it, but I think you have to put some parameters around it because remember in the old days, you couldn't do a consult unless you live far, far away, like a virtual. Um, but I don't think it can be far away anymore. But I don't know. I don't know what the answer is yet. I think you have to test things. But um, I used to say you have to live at least like 25 miles away or 50 miles away. And well, now I think it's you have to know your audience. I, I, I can tell you that you have to remember something that is very important in terms of the psychology and adaptability of people to, to virtual consults. You know, 
virtual consults 20 years ago were on the phone. People would call mm -hmm. in. I mean, I did the International Cosmetic Fellowship around the world. Mm -hmm. I operated on all six continents. I, I had patients calling me when it was midnight my time and it was 12 o'clock their time and all that stuff. And so initially there were the phones and then there was Skype. But now we live in the generation of Instagram where people want to see things instantaneously. You know, you post a picture on Instagram. If you don't get your 100 likes in your first hour, then boom, it's going to flop. So people are very attuned to that. So therefore, that same psychology and that same mind frame to a 26-year-old, you know, successful woman in her office, even half an hour away from me, who wants to have a nose job. She's thinking, you know, why can I send my picture to Dr. Bitar on Instagram? He can tell what he can do with my nose, but yet I cannot go live with him and for him to explain to me how can he do my rhinoplasty. And, or now that we have the privacy with having a patient care coordinator in the room, you know, mm -hmm. she can easily take off her top. I and mean, I did today consults on breast implants, tummy tucks, Brazilian butt lifts, you know, mm -hmm. all in one day. So, you know, a woman can be in the private of her own home, even in her own office and take her clothes off. And I have a chaperone with me in the virtual room, so to speak with, which is my nurse or my patient care coordinator. And that would save us time. It would save the patient time. It would save her driving an hour and a half to work. I mean, to be honest with you, if, if I would do all the consults from now on virtually, I'd be very happy because a lot of the time in consults is wasted putting a patient in the room, changing the room, getting their uh, you know, husband to take the kids in the stroller outside, then calling the husband back in when they want to try on things. So th there's a lot, I mean, I've learned it was a wake up call for me. I learned that there's a lot of wasted time in our consults and I consider ourselves to be a very efficient practice. Uh, so I think number one, virtual consults are here to stay. Number two, not everybody wants a virtual consult. So we will be able to see them in person, but you would be surprised that when we go back to life as, as it was before, Corona, you know, BC and AC now. Right. Uh, when we go to the BC times, you'd be surprised. My my bet is, I would say, oh, more than half of people under 25 years old will come to me for rhinoplasties, autoplasties, breast augmentations, liposuction. I'm gonna want to have their consults done virtually, even though they can't come into the office, and I'm gonna offer it to them. I think they're going to demand that for sure. Um, now, you might suggest doing like tier pricing. Um, if you really, actually, yeah. you have such a good close rate for your virtual, I, I would actually, I'd stick to that. But if you don't, um, some of the practices, I do suggest charging less for virtual, more for live to get people, or I'm sorry, or sometimes the other way around. They're trying to still get them in live. But if you're having such a good conversion rate, what the heck? Do it I was going to say, so if you don't mind, this podcast should be only broadcasted to people about 150 miles outside <laughs> of my radius so that they yeah. don't get my pearls. Yes. Turn this off right now. Yes, <laughs> anybody nearby. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is a really good time, though. You mentioned the hospital. Um, amongst all of this, you literally just opened up your own OR. Um, can you yeah, just talk about like, that? Yeah, I saw I, I tell my on. staff, it's like we send the bride to the altar all dressed up and the groom stood her up at the altar, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have a beautiful office. So it's <laughs> our setup in the Fairfax office. We have a 2,700 square foot beautiful office that we do everything in right now. We do surgeries, we do med spas, we do pre-ops and post-ops, consultations, even seminars. Uh, in the last year and a half, we built a surgery center right next door to our office. They're only separated by a corridor. Um, and so the new office is 3,700 square feet. So it's about almost time and a half the existing office. Oh, wow. It's got two beautiful operating rooms. And the way it was designed is that we're going to move all our surgical uh, business to the office next door where we have the operating rooms, we have exam rooms, we have the patient care coordinator rooms. And it's got a nice recovery room and the way outdoors, you know, it's on the ground floor so people can go from the back door straight to the car. They don't have to go through the lobby. And we'll keep the um, med spa services and the skin care in the existing office. So we'll separate the non-surgical from the surgical uh, services. And I mean, the setup is gorgeous. It's beautiful. Of course, I'm biased. I, I built it. But uh, I couldn't wait to start on March 30th. And then... You know, we got a, an unwanted visitor coming to town. Dear Lord. Um, I saw you, if anybody wants to look on Instagram, um, you did a great tour of the office, the new surgical center, and it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. I couldn't believe the timing on that. Um, 
but whatever. Uh, so what's the plan? When can you use I mean, it? The plan is we're going to be opening up on May 18, and we are going to uh, do all the uh, injectables uh, and uh, pre-ops and post-ops in the office, because we're already operating right now in the hospital. So the people that now I'm seeing in a half-empty office, they'll be coming back to a you know fully staffed office next week or so. And uh, you know, we're still trying to figure out our surgeries in the office because we have two operating rooms that are, uh, you know, that are meant to do general anesthesia. And so now we have an anesthesiology group that we're contracting with. My, our problem right now is it's very, very difficult to buy things to make the office safe for uh, coronavirus uh, patients, let alone operating. You know, whereas you have to have gowns and masks and gloves to see somebody pre-op and post-op. When you operate, you have to have certain filters for the anesthesia circuits, a box, you know, that they have to put above the patient to intubate anesthesiologist. You have to have the negative air in the operating room, and you have to have the air circulating. We're going to be getting the UV, um, uh, the air filters that also kill the particles in the air because you know, coronavirus is a very aerosolized uh, virus. Um, and quite frankly, for the safety of the staff and the safety of the patients, I'm not in a rush to go and operate in our new center because God forbid, if we have any problems right now and we don't have the wherewithal and the material to, to fix it, I'd rather keep the surgeries in the hospital where they have worked out those kinks in the last month and a half. And then when we get a little safer in the next two, three months, I don't know, uh, then operate in our office because our office was ready to be operated on in a pre-COVID era. Right now, I have to assess every little thing, the safety of the staff, the way we, you know, clean the surfaces, the how long does it take between one patient to another to bring them back into the room after we've done the previous surgery, what kind of surgeries we're doing. Um, I mean, I can tell you that we have a protocol where I have eliminated certain surgeries that I'm not doing anymore. Uh, for example, we're not doing any surgeries over four hours right now. Mm. I'm not doing anybody over 65 years old. Mm. I'm not doing anybody with a history of smoking, vaping, or asthma. We're not doing anybody with a BMI over 30. Mm. We're not doing anybody who has uh, comorbidities like hypertension or diabetes. Or we're not doing anybody who has a combination of those. And we're testing everybody for COVID, sometimes one test with rhinoplasties, I like two tests to be negative before I operate on them. So, I mean, we're being extremely cautious, but there are people who want to have cosmetic surgery. Right. Uh, we want to offer it to them. We have delayed it already a month and a half. We don't want to delay it anymore if we can do it safely. Um, talking about the test, did you find one that's um, user-friendly and you can get the results right away? Or how's that working out? Because the testing has been a big issue. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think it's going to continue being a big issue. The bottom line is we don't have one great test. And, and mm -hmm. if we have a test, it's not going to tell you all the information you want. It's either going to be the swab that's going to tell you yes. whether they have antigens or not. You're going to have the antibody test. Some of them have like 15 to 30 percent false negative. Some of them have false positive. Uh, some of them are not very specific. Uh, some of them, you can uh, order the test. By the time it comes, it's from a fake uh, company. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on right now that I'm hoping in the next month or two would be sort of like, uh, uh, you know, sorted out and we'll be able to have a better testing, more abundant testing and safer testing. As of now, the hospital where I'm at, at Fairfax, is uh, thankfully um, providing our patients with pre-op testing. And we don't operate to anyone unless they are negative. We are bringing testing for the staff, the 15-minute uh, antibody test that is rapid, that we can admit it in the office as we, you know, as we make our way back to the office. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have to always be careful, you know, as a surgeon and the people who are watching this who are surgeons in the era of HIV. I mean, we operate on people. We couldn't test them for HIV. We assumed everybody had HIV, everybody had hepatitis, and you just take your precautions. Mm -hmm. um, regarding staff, have, do you, are you testing them regularly? We will. I mean, we haven't brought them back yet, but we, we will when we bring them oh. back. And uh, we are going to test everybody. We're going to have a questionnaire for the staff and the patients every time they walk in the office. Make sure that we take everybody's fevers, we, temperature. We get them a, like a nine-point consent form. Mm -hmm. You know, have you been exposed to somebody with COVID? Uh, do you have a cough? Do you have a fever? Do you have a sore throat? 
Um, and do you have any um, symptoms that uh, are related to COVID? Have you been tested? So I think we're going to try to do our due diligence. But as you know, there's no perfect way of screening people. You can have been exposed to somebody yesterday, and then today you're not showing any symptoms, but you're still, you know, a carrier. Kind of like a pregnancy test. I mean, we've tested people who were negative, and then turned out that after the surgery they end up being pregnant because, you know, the, the, they had uh, sex like 24 hours before the surgery, and the, the pregnancy test the morning of the surgery was not accurate. So okay. it's kind of like we are working in a very um, uh, in an environment where you don't have all the answers. For sure. So uh, let's talk about the patients for a second. When, with these new requirements you have, um, let's say if there was 100% pie, how many, what percentage have you just kicked out with your new rules? And, and what's that doing to your patient flow? Because you can't see all the patients you want anyway. How are you handling the flow? And has it decreased dramatically or not at all? So, you know, we have now the patients that were on the books before this all happened. Right. And my, I can tell you that at least about 30% of them have been put on hold, or we may have offered them a smaller surgery. You know, perfect example, somebody who was going to be doing a rhinoplasty and the breast augmentation, I may just do the breast augmentation now and wait. Or somebody who was going to be having a rhinoplasty and a facelift, I may just do the rhinoplasty and wait on the facelift. So that's number one. Number two, uh, we may have to uh, retest them. You know, they may have been negative, but they may have, you know, converted recently. They may have uh, booked for a liposuction case, but now over the last month have gained a few pounds and are no longer a good candidate for what we thought they were a good candidate for. So we're assessing everybody. We're trimming down the surgeries. Uh, we, uh, and those were the old ones. The new ones, the ones who are now coming for virtual consults, they are being screened by the patient care coordinators before I even do the consult. So by the time I'm doing the consult, they kind of like, if somebody calls and says, I'm 79 years old, I want to have a facelift, she's not getting a virtual consult right now to begin with. We're saying, you know what, right now it's not safe, we're going to have, wait. Or if somebody says, I insist, I mean, I read about Dr. Peter, he does lower body lifts. Well, I'm not doing lower body lifts right now because it's in my hands, it's a six hour case, you know, and maybe other plastic surgeons are faster than me, but if I feel that a case is going to take me longer, I'm going to keep them in the hospital overnight. I'm not doing anything also to keep anybody in the hospital overnight. So whereas I used to do, for example, a breast reduction and a tummy tuck at the same time, I'm not doing those combinations at the same time right now. And, you know, I do a lot of webinars. We just did the Dallas Rhinoplasty course with Dr. Rorick this weekend. We did the ASAPs webinar last week. We're doing every day. There's a different webinar. And, you know, the plastic surgeons ourselves are confused as to what is the right thing to do. I don't think anybody claims to have all the right answers. I mean, we are taking the information that we have. We're trying to make the best decisions to protect ourselves, our staff, our patients. Uh, you know, but anytime you see a webinar and you get somebody who's quote unquote an expert speak, right. I can guarantee you can get somebody else who's going to be, you know, drilling holes in that person's statement. I feel for you guys, but it's never been more important for you to have a business mindset than it is now because the math has changed so much for you. You can't have that kind of overhead and 50% of the patient flow that you used to have. You've all got to figure that out. And I, I don't have a good answer. I actually, I have plenty of answers, but um, you, know, you, you, know, you know what I mean? You have to really look no, at. I mean, we are, we are living. We are living in a in a rational, you know, say a rationed world right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are going to put off Botox. They're going to put off their surgeries. Uh, but you know, you'd be surprised how many people we have seen in the last month and a half in virtual consults that are you know, want to have their surgery yesterday. You know, I'm young. I'm healthy. I've been sitting at home. I've been making money because I'm an IT consultant. I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my own business. I'm selling things online. I had a woman that I did a consult with who was a virtual fitness instructor. So all her work before this was on online anyway. Uh, and these people want to have surgery right now. They feel it's a great time to recuperate. So, right. you know, it's not for everybody. And a lot of people are going to say, you know, this is not the time to have cosmetic surgery. But there are other people that say this is the best time to have cosmetic surgery. Sure. I have a friend of mine who's a surgeon 
who I operated on last week because he was uh, not operating himself. He's like, well, this is my time to have my surgery. So. Right. <laughs> right. Right. so let's switch over to marketing because one thing you guys really have down is marketing, brand. You know how to brand, like you are what, the top tier in branding. And I, I don't know why more surgeons don't get this, but you've also put in the work to make that happen. Um, dear Lord, I mean, if, if some write papers, you write 10 times more papers. <laughs> if some have PR, you've had 10 times more PR. Like you've really, you, I, just so you know, from a marketing perspective, I applaud you for putting in the effort because it really does differentiate you from all the competitors in a wildly competitive arena. So how did you know to do all of that? Where did all the marketing finesse come from? Well, I mean, um, you know, part of it may be my Lebanese background. I think uh, if you come from Lebanon, you have that entrepreneurial spirit in you. Um, partly because I had good mentors along the way and partly because cosmetic surgery is a desire. It's not a need, you know? I mean, you don't have to have a facelift. You don't have to have a tummy tuck. So when people come to me and say, do I need a facelift? Like, you don't need a facelift. Nobody needs a facelift. Are you going to do it because you want to do it? So. Uh, you know, my dad is a pediatrician and he practiced pediatrics for 52 years and God bless him. You know, he was your wonderful, you know, Dr. Welby type of pediatrician that everybody adores. And my practice couldn't be any further different from what his practice was. But did you do that on purpose? No, no. I mean, I, I mean, I, I do it. Uh, and say, I don't want to do that. I want to be something else than that. Cause I love Dr. Welby. That was a great, most people have no idea what you just said, but that was Yeah, but Dr. Cool. Welby, you know, when you have only two patients a week, then you can survive. <laughs> but then today, I mean, that was nice in the 1960s, but now <laughs> you cannot, you cannot practice the medicine that my father and Dr. Welby practiced where they do house calls and they'd see two patients a day and they spend with the whole, in, in, you know, uh, extended family, seven hours discussing, a kid's problem. We can't do that right now. That's unrealistic. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is if you want to be successful as cosmetic surgery, I think you need two things, really. One is you need to know what you're doing because unlike, I mean, I'm a general surgeon before being a plastic surgeon. I've removed a lot of gallbladders. I've done open heart surgeries. Mm -hmm. I've removed tumors from brains. I've done hip replacements, uh, hysterectomies, liver transplants. I've done that all. And you have a very hard time judging whether a liver transplant surgeon is good or not, except by the result of the health of the patient. That's good. With cosmetic surgery, the minute somebody walks out of the operating room in the recovery room, the nurses start judging whether you do good eyelid lifts or a good nose job or not by seeing the patient in the immediate in the recovery. Let alone right now, we have social media, we have uh, you know online reviews, so your work is out there for everybody to see and criticize. And for every one person who says something nice, there are not, you know, 10 other people who want to criticize. So, you know, the, the, uh, if somebody has a nice cosmetic uh, outcome, they want to keep it to themselves. If I had a penny for everybody, I had a great result on who refused to give me consent to show their photos, I'd be, I'd be rich. That's Whereas true. the people who don't have a good result, you know, the one or 2% are not happy. They're going to go to every single Yelp review and stuff and write about you. So, with that being said, I think number one, you need to know what you're doing. And number two, as you mentioned, there are a lot of other plastic surgeons in town. So if somebody is paying out of their own pocket and they're doing something unessential, it's very different dynamic than if somebody is having an open heart surgery or their gallbladder removed, because if they have a gallbladder that needs to be removed, they're gonna go to their medical doctor. Their medical doctor says, go to Dr. X, he's gonna take out your gallbladder. That's it, that's the end of the discussion. Mm -hmm. But if you are a 18 year old girl who wants to have a rhinoplasty, you are gonna go on Instagram, you're gonna see every single person in the world who does rhinoplasties, you're gonna compare, you're going to send the messages, you're gonna, an average, you know, uh, research it for about six months to a year before you realize. So if you don't have something that separates you from the rest, you know, you're not the, you're, the people are not gonna come and knock on your door. And a lot of doctors who, start out as plastic surgeons wanting to be a fully cosmetic surgeons end up covering the emergency room because that's the easy, you know, that's the easy path. Nothing against that, but I'm saying if you want to truly be a cosmetic surgeon, you got to put the effort in, you got to create the, uh, the reason why people would come to you and not to the other hundred plastic surgeons in your marketplace. You know, you have nice results. You have a nice office. Are your staff, you know, uh, responsive? Do they uh, portray a good image of you? Do your results 
you know, speak for themselves. Are you, you know, did you just do one of those facelifts five years ago or you have constant results on your website? Uh, when people come to your office, is your office nice and clean? Uh, you know, when they deal with you in the hospital, the nurses have nice things to say about you. All that is part of the brand and, and you have to work at it every single day. It's nothing, nothing is, you know, nothing is taken for granted. You've done so much in that area and, and you have to, if you're going to be in the middle of Washington, DC, you have to do that. I don't see how you could have survived without it, but you went above and beyond. I mean, you really did do a lot for that. Um, where does your, I want to talk about your wife for a second, because actually I'm going to do some podcasts on this, like how to work with a spouse. Um, and it can go both ways. Sometimes the surgeon is the, the wife and the, and the doctor's the uh, business person. But I have noticed the ones that work the best, the doctor, that you have very different personalities. Usually, usually, I'm just going to generalize. The wife is the fluffy, the fluffy one, you know, the, like the more people skilled one to keep the staff happy and fuzzy. And the doctor's the more focused clinical and so like there's like good guy bad guy kind of thing or one of them's more business related and the other one's more marketing um how, how does that work with you two because you have a great team you know you're a good team together so we are like completely against all the stereotypes okay i, I can tell you that right right off the bat um I, i'll tell you for starters when i met my wife she said that when she was five years old she wanted to be the first female astronaut Oh my God! You don't, you don't know too many girls who want to become before. an astronaut when they were five years old. Right. Um, secondly, she's also from Lebanon, like me. Oh. Uh, I immigrated from Lebanon with my family when I was 16, and I came to the States, and I went to college and med school here, and basically did my career here. Uh, she, on the other hand, uh, grew up in Lebanon, but came to the United States by herself. Uh, to study electrical engineering at UCLA. So she left her whole family half the world away uh, after she did her undergrad at the American University of Beirut, which is an excellent university, got a degree in electrical engineering, and then came and did a master's and a PhD in electrical engineering at UCLA. And, um, you know, and won the Teacher of the Year award. So I mean, I can brag about my wife a lot, but but how did you meet if you're in L if she's on the west coast and you're on the east coast how did you meet we had we had mutual friends in LA because I did a cosmetic fellowship in Beverly Hills so I knew a lot of people there oh. and one of these people happened to be living in the same dorms as her and the the common denominator was that we were both of Lebanese origin and he told okay. her I know this Lebanese guy and he told me I know the Lebanese girl and he hooked us up together Oh, uh, a referral. <laughs> and yeah, it was a great referral. Uh, but the uh, so, but going fast forwarding to now, us working together. I mean, I think my wife is a very hard worker. Mm -hmm. uh, she takes the practice very seriously, and I think the way I compare her handling the practice is like somebody learning, either somebody growing up with English or somebody learning English as a second language. She learned plastic surgery as a second language. Mm -hmm. As a result, because she came from an engineering background, she brought literally, when she started with me the practice, when she joined me, I had started the practice in 2002, and then she joined me as the uh, executive director in 2010. So we were eight years into it, mm -hmm. but she went and bought every single book about managing plastic surgery practices, oh. read them, you know, and she was great at data analysis and data mining. So she already came with, a very different set of skills that she applied. And so we kind of look at the practice from a very difficult, you know, different standpoint. I want to make my patients happy. I want to spend time with them. I want to, you know, give them free stuff here and there because that's what doctors like to do to make their patients happy. You know, she wants to look at the staff, whether they have used up their time, whether they're going to overtime, whether the things that we did for marketing a year ago are still pertinent. You know, whether that vendor who is uh, doing our internet is still cost effective, we need to move to another vendor. You know, whether our uh, 401k for the staff is with the right financial company. So she does all the things that I hate to do, quite frankly, yeah. and that I was never good at. And I like to focus on taking care of patients, being the creative person, you know, and, and we have an office manager that runs the day-to-day -day activity, Gerald. So between Gerald, Rima and me, I think we have a very good grip on the practice. And whenever we're interviewing somebody who comes into the practice, I tell them, 
you know, when you walk into a practice where that is run by a husband and a wife team, you may have a concern that, you know, what if these two guys fight one day? What's going to happen to my job? I say that's a very legitimate concern. Um, let me reassure you that we're never going to fight one day. We fight every day. <laughs> <laughs> You're very consistent. <laughs> every single day, every single thing we disagree on and fight it out. But the nice thing is, you know, we fight it out based on facts and based on mutual respect. So it's not the fight for the sake of fighting. It's the fight for the sake of trying to come up with the best solution for the practice. And we've made it work for 10 years uh, through govern uh, government furloughs, through the recession, you know, and now through COVID. So I think we have a very good system. And I think we love our staff. And, uh, you know, I, I feel that we go above and beyond for them and they do for us as well. So I, I think it has worked out for us. But I think the key is we're both very hard workers. You know, Rima is sitting sometimes, you know, Sunday night until midnight trying to figure out employee uh, bonuses or a new marketing campaign or if we're going to be instilling a new software for our before and after photos and she wants to work out the kinks before we introduce it. You know, so, so we have, you know, it's, it's a busy practice, as you know. Mm -hmm. We have a high volume. And we do a lot of uh, services from skincare to injectables to lasers to all surgeries. We do facial surgery, rhinoplasties, and body surgery. And we have a very robust non surgical practice, you know, with all therapy machines, the fractional laser machines, uh, cool sculpt. We have more cool sculpt than anybody in the DC area. We have four cool sculpt machines. Oh, wow. We have Exilus, we have M sculpt. Uh, so our skincare, our injectable, our laser, our non-surgical, and our surgical practice are all, you know, working full steam. Now, of course, COVID is going to change things. We still really don't know how it's going to change things. We're going to go in, dip our toe in the water before we dive in, but we are, you know, we are an aggressive practice. We're not going to basically sit at home and, uh, and just do, do anything. I mean, we We've, we've done a lot of consults. We've, we've seen our patients in the office. All the patients who wanted to be seen have been seen. Um, you know, so I think we're very proud of the fact that even in these hard times, I feel that we were able to you know, take care of our existing patients who already had surgery with us, manage the people who were on the books but have not had surgery, and be able to service the ones that want to have surgery in the future and uh, do it to them in as professional a way as we can. You know, you brought up um, bonuses, and that's actually going to be another uh, fence to jump over because they haven't been working. A lot of the staff count on those bonuses. Like, you know how they spend the money before they get it because they know they're going to get it. But sure. without the patient flow, that's a whole other complex. How do you fix that when we've been off work for two months or, or who knows how long, you know? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I have a simple philosophy. I mean, I think if the practice does well, the staff does well. If the practice mm -hmm. doesn't do well, the staff doesn't do well. It's as simple as that. So do you um, bonus as a team or do you have... We have, we have a bonus structure that is based on two tiers, the, what the team does and what the individual does. Okay. Because it's sort of demoralizing if you feel that you are working very hard and the team is not and you have to um, suffer because of them. And the reverse is true. I feel if there is a collective bonus, then people push each other because yeah. they feel that if you're not going to be working, then I'm not going to get my bonus. I'm not going to have that. Uh, yeah. So it is partly motivational and partly it's to keep a successful business. I mean, we're not a charity. We're a business. We have to make profitability. Uh, we, we do a lot for our staff and our patients. And you cannot have a luxurious practice if you are not making the money. It's, it's very simple. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I feel that our bonus structure uh, creates a competitive, if you will, but also a progressive environment in the practice. And over the years, quite frankly, I think staff members who couldn't put up with it went elsewhere. For sure. Meaning, meaning we did not have to fire them. I think among the staff, if the staff feels somebody is lazy and they're not pulling their weight, mm -hmm. it, it, they make it uh, just uncomfortable for them and they just leave. And, it, it, and, mm -hmm. and I mean, we don't do it on purpose. I usually find out about it in retrospect because I'm too busy operating and stuff. But let's say we hire a uh, front desk staff person and, you know, she's nice, she's smiling, she's 
And then three weeks later, I find out that she left. And I say, well, why? She said, well, you know, she wanted to take two hour lunch breaks. She mm -hmm. was more interested in doing her nails than taking care of the patients. And the rest of the staff would not have that. So, you know. Uh, I like when they self-police. That means that you have built a culture and not everyone fits into your culture. Right. I mean, I tell everybody that I, I, I interview and I interview everybody who we bring on board. I said, this is not an easy place to work. If you mm -hmm. want to come and take two hour lunch breaks and take your like three hour hair dressing appointment in the afternoon, I say, you know, my wife and I are very, very hard workers. We probably work harder than anybody in the practice, mm -hmm. but we do expect you to pull your, your weight. So yes, I mean, it's a culture and you know, some people may tell you, oh, I don't want to go work for the Vitar Institute. They're very, you know, they're very hard on their employees and they're right. I mean, I, I don't uh, dispute it, but for the right person, it's very rewarding that the patients get treated very well. And at the end of the day, I think if you ask your our staff, would you have your family member operate on in this uh, institute, they would say yes. You know, versus okay. other places that may, you know, they may be making money, they may be having a good time, but they'll say, oh, I'll never have my staff, I'll never have my mother being operated on here because yeah. I don't trust the doctor, I don't trust the, the aftercare, but I work here because the money is good. I don't want to ever hear that. That's so true. Um, so good for you, good for you. Um, I know Rima is so good with numbers. Boy, she, when I had a question, she had a number for it. She was amazing. And I have noticed though, the most successful practices know their numbers. And they know them daily, not yearly. They know them daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. Uh, they compare it against last year. They know what's going on. No, I mean, look, you cannot, uh, you know, the, the dictators, you cannot uh, assess something, you cannot measure something if you don't know, or you, know, you cannot know where you are if you can't measure your success. So that, that's number one true. Mm -hmm. But also, I think the numbers are more than just numbers. They tell you the trends. I mean, I'll tell you a very, uh, two examples. Uh, you know, one day she came to me and says, we need to have pool sculpt in the practice. I said, but the pool sculpt is going to cannibalize our liposuction. Um, he said, you know, our numbers for liposuction has been going up for the last 10 years. And this year they flattened out. And next year, I'm afraid they're going to start coming down because other people who have pool sculpt machines are taking away from us the business. Mm -hmm. Fast forward eight years later, right now we have four pool sculpt machines and we do more liposuction. So that was a decision made on numbers. Another decision was I did a lot of transaster breast augmentation with saline implants. I love saline yeah. implants. They were easy to put in. And she came to me one day and said, we need to do silicone implants from the armpit. I'm like, I, it's, this, the hole is small. I cannot put a silicone implant in here. I can put it underneath. Uh -huh. like, well, you got to learn how to do it. So I mm -hmm. went and learned how to do it with a Keller funnel. And yep. now, six years later, I do 99% of my breast implants from the armpit with silicone implants. There you go. Uh, but what that did is it kept our implant or our breast augmentation numbers going up because when she told me that, it was the year there was a crisscross. The silicone implants were on the rise, the saline implants were on the decline, and that's the year that they intersected. So knowing your numbers is important not just in cosmetic surgery as a business. You know, you can, you can translate that to if you're a car maker and everybody else is making electric cars and you're still stuck on the fossil fuel cars, one of these days you're going to be buried alive. Mm -hmm. And the uh, people who did not adapt to, you know, uh, watches that were digital watches, you know, they, they went by the wayside and Swatch came and, and ate their supper. So, I mean, like any business, I think you need to know your environment, especially in cosmetic surgery where the people who are asking for it are very well informed. They are highly motivated. They are, they care for their looks. They have the money to spend and they're gonna do their research and they want the latest and the greatest and the best for themselves. Mm -hmm. Nobody says, I dream of being operated on by a mediocre plastic surgeon, you know? <laughs> so um, have you added any new marketing avenues after COVID or do you think you're gonna market any differently after or now? Than you, did you know, that's a good question. I think uh, one thing that we have started doing recently that has been very successful, that has brought us a lot of new consults is um, um, our live uh, Instagrams. Yep. And whereas we had done maybe one or two live Instagrams in the past, a year apart, when I go to a conference or when an event happens, now we made the uh, commitment to do a live Instagram every Friday. Oh, Friday or Saturday, idea. depending on the guest. So four weeks ago, we had Ashley Iconetti, who was on The Bachelor, and she's a oh. patient of ours, and I did the model lift on her. So 
she appeared and our viewership went up the roof because she has over a million viewers. Uh, then we had one of our patients as well that I did a model lift and the rhinoplasty on who's an actress and the producer, Rebecca Franklin, who came, we talked about rhinoplasties, about uh, you know, model lift and that went very well. Uh, and then I invited my friend to be on the podcast, Dr. Ramton Kassir, who is in uh, New York. Yeah, Park Avenue. And I go back to the days of residency. I've known him for over 20 years. Oh, my goodness. And so he ta we talked about facelifts, about uh, lip lifts, rhinoplasties, you know, the situation in New York versus D.C. And it was a lot of fun. And quite frankly, because he's sitting with his kids, I'm sitting with my kids. It was an excuse for us to talk to each other for a whole one hour uninterrupted. <laughs> And then last week, uh, we got, uh, I, I was interviewed by a major med spa in Lebanon, and they wanted me to talk in Arabic, but because we have now international clientele, we end up doing it in English, but I could have easily done it in Arabic um, mm -hmm. and French. Uh, but because we had a lot of our, our patients here, our viewers wanted to listen in, they said, please, can you do it in English? So I said, okay. Yeah. Or at least subtitles. <laughs> well, it's just when you're doing it live, it's just too, too much of a hassle. But then uh, this weekend, I had Paul Nassif with me, who you don't yeah, need to uh, any introduction. Paul and I go back all so long ways. He's a great guy, mm -hmm. you know, from botch to having a very successful practice to having a, you know, a new baby on the way to, uh, you know, uh, practicing in Beverly Hills. It, it was a and lot being of fun. Lebanese? He's Lebanese too. I didn't That's know right. That. We, had, mm -hmm. we had a question whether you like Fatouch or Kabuli more. And, yes. uh, you know, so, so that. And now, I, next week, I'm going to have Matthew Shulman coming on our Instagram live. I don't know if you know Matthew, Dr. Uh, Dr. New York. So he, he is big on Instagram, Matt Shulman, and he does a lot of body contouring. So because we did a lot of facial uh, mm -hmm. podcasts or uh, Instagram lives, I want to do one on body contouring because I also do a lot of breasts and tummies and Brazilian butt lifts. And uh, he was on a recent ASAPS seminar, and so he has new techniques, so I'm bringing him on. So, you know, partly plastic surgeon, partly reporter, partly having fun. How many hours a day are you spending on marketing? You and social media and branding you? How, how, what, what kind of time are you putting in on that? It's difficult to say because I also, I'm doing a lot of uh, things uh, academically. I mean, I was at the Rhinoplasty Dallas meeting this Saturday and I had to present a PowerPoint presentation on uh, rhinophyma. So I had to sit down and get all my photos in order. I had to do my research. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on that. We have a new chapter coming up in a book on PRP for hair transplant, uh, sorry, for hair growth. Mm -hmm. So I had to edit that chapter. I have another chapter coming up with uh, Doug Steinbrecht in New York in a book on male cosmetic surgery on uh, necklaces on men. So that hasn't come out yet. It's coming out. So I do a lot of uh, talks, lectures, um, you know, uh, seminars. We had a huge co conference coming up next year for the Association of Plastic Surgeons of Lebanese Descent, which I'm going to be the chairman of. Oh, okay. 500 plastic surgeons from around the world. But now we're going to have to postpone it a year to 2022. But mm -hmm. we don't have any sponsorship money. You mm -hmm. know, the, it's going to be a big conference at the Ritz Carlton in DC. And that's a pretty expensive conference mm -hmm. with 500 plastic surgeons from around the world. So that, I was working a lot on that until the last minute when I realized that, you know, we cannot keep asking the big sponsors for money when they don't have the money. You just have to say, okay, we'll postpone it a year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those things, as well as the patients that I've already operated on, that I'm seeing the virtual consults, our staff and their issues, um, researching uh, COVID. We have a fellowship. We have the ASAPS fellowship, and I was interviewing for the 2022, we just hired a fellow for 2021, 2022 year. Oh, nice. uh, so I was working on her paperwork, uh, you know, so there's a lot going on. And even though we're not operating at full speed right now, but the work of hiring an anesthesia team, the work of finishing up our new surgery center, taking care of our patients, doing those live Instagrams, uh, it just all takes time. And I have two kids at home, so I like to spend some time with them. We're doing board games. We're going out, you know, on their scooters, on the bikes. We, we swim in the afternoon when the weather permits. We, you know, we do uh, family uh, baking sessions. We, my wife is like, uh, her new hobby now is doing some baking at home. So we're also spending a lot of time with the kids. My, my, my parents live close by, so we're also spending time with the extended family. It's a hodgepodge, Catherine. Do you ever sleep? 
<laughs> yes, I do. Do you? Are you like that Tony Robbins who sleeps four hours a night? I mean, probably I sleep five or six hours, so I, I beat him. I need eight. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a loser. I need eight. <laughs> so um, no. is there any uh, advice you can give anybody who's dealing with this? Because a lot of the surgeons, you know, some of the med spas aren't going to make it. Some of the practices who don't have the math right aren't going to make it. Um, is there any uh, thoughts about that and what yeah. you could offer I, I can tell you that my advice is going to be a very simple advice um, you know when I started this practice I called it an institute for a reason I wanted there to be the three you know the three steps of that stool to keep mm -hmm. it sturdy the first step or the, the first uh, pillar of our practice if you want is patient care I mean as a doctor first and the plastic surgeon second the most important thing I do and the thing that I get trusted by people's lives to do mm -hmm. is to do their surgery. You know, mm -hmm. some people may book cosmetic surgery, but we just uh, put a picture of a lady. I did a rhinophyma on our Instagram that her life was changed by this operation. I saw that. That was amazing. I mean, literally. Uh, we have people that I've done breast reductions on that, you know, uh, were, were depressed and didn't want to go on with life anymore. And now all of a sudden, you know, there's bounce in their step. We, we've had people who've had gastric bypass surgeries and lost 200 pounds and have all that loose skin. And now when you do their lower body lift, they can, you know, go through life with pride and with, with dignity and, and being able to have a new sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's my first goal is to, you know, give to the patients who trusted me what they came to me for, which is a cosmetic surgery. Sometimes it is to boost your ego, to boost your self-esteem. Sometimes it's really life-changing. And the spectrum is wide, as you know. Right. The second uh, pillar of our practice is basically uh, being part of our community. We've done a lot of fundraising. I was the man of the year for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in 2006. I raised the most money in the country for leukemia and lymphoma because I had a very good friend of mine who was a co-fellow in, in my fellowship program who died from leukemia. So I did it in his honor. Mm. Uh, we both started our practice and three months later, he called me up and said, George, I have leukemia. And two months after that, he died. Oh my so, uh, so basically I did the fundraising in his honor. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of work with the care organization, with the Hoop Dreams in DC, with the uh, cancer societies, uh, you know, 5K runs. And so I think it's good for the staff. It's good for the patients. It's good for our soul. It's, it's food for our soul and spirit. It's like, you know, yes, I'm a cosmetic surgeon. I love what I do. I'm an artist, but I also want to feel that I am a valued member of the community. And I think we have achieved that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I do a lot of work uh, with charities in Lebanon and stuff that's kind of like in the, in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, you know, I, I left Lebanon as a teenager. I felt I want to help in some way. I never went back, but I like to help, you know, the people of Lebanon. We have extended families there. There's a lot of misery over there. There's a lot of help that needs to be done. And I could, you know, I could talk to you a whole hour about that. Uh, the third pillar is the educational aspect. Okay. So we try to do seminars. We are educational on Instagram. When we post things on Instagram, they have to be educational. They have to be well thought out. They have to also be entertaining. I mean, I'm, I'm not catering to plastic surgeons on Instagram. I'm catering to the lay public. But mm -hmm. also, the lay public are savvy and they're knowledgeable and they want to get something out of your post other than just a picture. They want to have an explanation. They want to have a you know, call to action. They want to have a pros and cons of why do I do this? Why do I not do this? Uh, we also have a fellowship, an ASAPS fellowship, as you mentioned, and that requires a lot of work. We have to have our fellow, you know, knowledgeable. We have to operate. They have to go to conferences. We did a partnership with Hopkins, with UVA. So our, our, our fellow goes to Hopkins and UVA, gets their didactics because we are a private practice. They'll get a lot of surgeries out of us. Mm -hmm. But in terms of getting resident uh, meetings on Wednesday mornings and presentations and guest lecturers, they need the university program to get that. And we have provided that for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we also write a lot of articles and chapters and books and present at meetings. I mean, this year, I think I had like about seven meetings that I was supposed to go to present. And Me too, yeah. I, I went to two of them and then the one. other, I think five got canceled. Uh, I went to one in Toronto and one in Quebec. 
I had one in Vegas. Uh, mm-hmm. I did the Dallas Rhinoplasty virtual one this weekend with uh, Dr. Rorick. That, that was kind of came up the last minute. Right. Uh, but I was going to go to Monaco, uh, do one in Monaco, one in uh, France, the French Society, um, one in London uh, with mm-hmm. Fouad Nahai and Tino Mendieta, and uh, one in Lebanon. But it all, you know, it all got canceled. Yeah. You, you got to do what you so. That's like a long answer to your question. So mm-hmm. when you said, what should people do? Mm-hmm. My answer is stick to what you do best. You know, right now, I don't think it's the time to start new ventures. Yes. You know, <laughs> right now, take the things that you know how to do because you're gonna have limited staff, mm-hmm. you're gonna have limited finances. So I think the last thing you want to do right now is try something that is not try and true. So if you are a facial surgeon, don't now decide you want to go and learn how to do a new way of breast augmentations to bring new money into the practice. That doesn't make sense. You know, do your facial surgery and do it right. If you were a med spa, you know, right now is not the time to go buy $200,000 machine. You know, take the machines that you have and make the most of them. Uh, if you are a surgeon who does a lot of breast augmentations, you know, whether you want to do um, Instagram uh, sessions on breast augmentations. You want to get testimonials. You want to have a um, you know an afternoon social for your breast augmentation patients and thank them. Whatever you have to do, but right now is not the time to decide. Oh, I'm going to do a new technique and five lifts because you know I want to have a new source of income. I, I I think that that would be very stupid. Now, as we move forward, if you want to increase the or diversifying your practice when you figure out what's going on i'm all for it i mean i've diversified my practice every year so i'm i don't like to stand still i like to keep moving but also when you are dealing with limited finances and the patient uh, trust right now being shaky and covid in the air you don't want to you know the the book I, i've read all the books of um by the guy who wrote Good to Great, um, oh, good Built to, great. to Last. Yeah. yeah, he wrote Good to Great, Built to Last. Yeah. What's I'm his blanking name? on his name. Oh my God, I have the book sitting right here. <laughs> yeah. Right, but, but, but when he wrote the book yeah. Built to Last, he said, mm-hmm. you know, first throw bullets and then cannonballs. You know, right now is right. not the time to go buy huge machines. Do the right. things that work and then expand to doing the, you know, the, the, the things that, may end up being big game changers. Is it Tom but, Collins? Huh? Is it Tom Collins? I think Tom Collins. You're right. Collins. Him or Tom Peters he, sounds or like a, he sounds like a drink. I think it's... <laughs> Maybe it's Tom Collins. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, yeah, I read all his books. And I need to reread those. It's been a while. Yeah. Uh, he and uh, Malcolm Gladwell, I think, are, are yep. excellent. They're my yep. favorite. The outliers. But, but, but I, I've learned a lot of good business advice from, you know, good to great. He said, draw the three circles. You know, what you're good at, what you are, you know, uh, what you like to do, and uh, what's your business denominator, and where that intersects, do it. So I gave up all reconstructive surgery. I gave up all the cosmetic surgery that I don't like to do and I'm not good at, and I kept the things that I'm good at and I like to do and that have profitability because we're not a charity. So a I think... <laughs> no, I agree. On, um, we have, on a personal note, because we're going to wrap it up now, I really am fascinated with how does a kid from Lebanon who came here at 16 end up where you ended up? Because the only thing, I'm I'm one of those ignorant Americans who came from Chicago and I still have the accent, although I left 40 years ago. I never understood what was going on over there. I still don't understand, but I did see that movie Beirut only because I love John Hamm, I think his name is. From Mad Men. I, ne- I never saw it because I lived it. <laughs> Ooh, it is, it's not pretty. It's a real tough movie to watch. My, my um, guess is probably it's even watered down from reality. Wow. What the heck was that like? I mean, look, uh, I grew up in Beirut where Beirut was considered to be the Paris of the Middle East, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, I was born in 1968, so I'm 52 years old now. And the war started in 1975. So I was like six or seven years old when the war started. And then I came to the States when I was 16. So I lived 10 years in war. And, uh, you know, when I first came here, and I came here as a freshman to the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. So it could not have been a, a very different environment from war in Beirut to being a freshman. I came and I started the college at 16. And so it was a, a, a interesting, interesting transition, to say the least. 
but I think war uh, taught me a lot of things. I mean, it taught me, number one, how to be re resilient, mm. you know, because it was not a sprint. It was a marathon. You know, day after day, you go to school. You don't know whether you're going to finish your class. You don't know whether a bomb's going to fall on your class. Mm. Um, number two, it taught me not to take anything for granted because, you know, we lived in a very uncertain environment. I mean, it, it was like COVID-19 multiplied by a million. Uh, we lived in a place where you didn't know whether you're going to get killed or shot at any day. I and mean, I, I was shot at at least three times in my life. Luckily, the people who shot at me were not bad. They were, were bad uh, shooters. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I almost got kidnapped once. Uh, and so there were a lot of things that, you know, at this point, they're not relevant to this conversation. But what is relevant is it teaches you how to appreciate life and how to put things in perspective. You know, so I don't sweat the small stuff. Um, I pay attention to detail, but I know that I'm going to overcome this. You know, I tell my staff, I, you know, I, I survived 10 years of war, medical school, two residencies and two fellowships. I'm going to get you through this. And when I tell them that, they believe me because, you know, it's, uh, it's true. Um, so, you know, I, I'll tell you a, a, a simple story. When I took the SAT, because I had to come to the States, I had no choice. It was like a spring of 1985, and I was immigrating here like two months later. So I had to take my SATs to be able to enter college. And we went to the American University of Beirut, and we arrived there at like 7.30 in the morning, and the test was going to start, I think, like 8.30 or something. And during that hour, between the time we arrived and the time the test was going to be given, there was a lot of fighting going on outside. And the, the, the sound of the bombs and the artillery was getting louder and louder. And then we enter into the classroom and the, the noise of the bombs and the war going on outside of the classroom was so loud that we had an American professor. He was one of the probably last Americans who were left there before they were evacuated, uh, said, look, if we open up those uh, packets for the SAT, you have to take the test. Otherwise, we'll lose accreditation from the United States. If you don't want to take it, that's fine. You can leave now. But once you open it, it's a four-hour test and you have to take it. I remember about two thirds of the class left, but I was one of those people who had to take it. So I had to stay. And the, the one thing I do remember is because it was a classroom with big glass windows, because two thirds of the class left, the people who were sitting there next to the windows were all moved inwards to be away from the windows. And then the teacher had to write the instructions on the chalkboard because we couldn't hear him. It was so loud. We could read what he was writing, but if he was saying something in the front of the classroom, we couldn't hear him. I was in, like sitting in the middle of the class. I couldn't even hear him. And I took that test for four hours under those circumstances, not knowing when a bomb's going to fall outside of the classroom and kill all of us. So, you know, the, the irony is I finished that exam. I came to the States. I got uh, accepted based on my TOEFL exam, test of English for foreign language. And I never knew my SAT scores because they were mailed to the United States and then they went back to Lebanon. I came here, so I, I never found out, but I was accepted anyway, so I didn't bother finding out. Okay, um, that is an insane story. It is. It, it, if I didn't know you, I would say you're making it up. Um, yeah. Nobody lives through things like that. That's insane. I, you, I can't even imagine. I but can't I can, imagine what that was. I can tell you at least about 50 stories like this. But I say it because, because it's an SAT exam, you can relate to it. You can right. relate to the fact that I was, I mean, I was 10 years old swimming in a beach and there were Syrian soldiers. I thought there were like fish flying next to me because there was like water. It turns out that there were Syrian soldiers on a hill using me for target practice and shooting at me. And I ran out of the water and they started shooting at the sand and the sand was flying next to me and I had to run for shelter. Like I said, luckily they were like bad, <laughs> bad aids. But yeah, I was 10 years old and there was like no good reason. It just felt like it. How, I don't even know how you're rational right now. But, That's insane. It really life, is. Life went on. <laughs> well, it, I mean, America's been good for you, you know? It has been great for me. It has been yeah. great for me and my family. So, uh, I mean, at least know. there's that, you know, like you went through hell and now you're hopefully in heaven. Yeah, um, but the interesting part is my generation did not have PTSD. We all felt like, you know, this is life and you just get... possible? I, I mean, I have lots. I mean, I'm still very good friends with all my high school, high school friends. And, and to boot, you know, I can tell you this interesting story. When I was in high school for three years, between the time I was 13 to the time I was 16, we had a band. We formed a band. 
and uh, we we played in schools and auditoriums of universities. We had a, the best time during a war going on. Oh my God. The band was called Quaking Bush, and uh, we called it Quaking Bush out of a uh, character in a novel by John Knowles called Separate Peace. I don't know if you ever came across no. that novel. John Knowles was a very uh, prolific writer, but he wrote this novel called The Separate Peace about two guys in the Northeast uh, uh, New England dorms while World War II was going on. And we could relate to them because there was a war going on in Europe while they were having a separate peace in New England. And our band was our separate peace from the war. Anyway, so we formed this band. We played for three years. It was a great time. And then we literally got scattered all over the world when high school finished. Mm -hmm. And uh, like about eight months ago, I saw one, and I kept in touch with four out of the five band members. I was the manager and the songwriter. I never, oh. I was never gifted enough to play a musical instrument. You know, <laughs> those who can do, those who cannot manage. Well, they need something to play, and you did the song, so you're in. And the, and the management, but anyway, the the so I'm on so I'm on Facebook about eight months ago, and one of our band members, who was a uh, drummer, our drummer ends up being a CEO of a company in Malaysia, and at their big banquet, he is playing the drums. He kicks out the guitar uh, drummer, and he goes up on his own, you know, company's. Uh, end of the year and he plays the drums and I see it on Facebook and I said Ramsey you know this reminds me of our Quaking Bush days he goes well what are you waiting for I'm like what, am, what do you mean what am I waiting for he goes let's get the band together <laughs> and so we end up so we end up doing a big search on social media to find the other two members that were missing and we found one guy who is a head of Credit Suisse in Hong Kong he was our keyboardist the rhythm guitarist is a big banker in London. I'm here. Oh. There was the bass guitarist is a uh, architect in uh, Texas. And uh, let's see, who's the last one? Yeah, and the, the drummer is in Malaysia. So basically, oh, and the lead guitarist was the only one that we thought was going to be a, become a musician, ends up actually becoming a musician. He has his band in L.A. So oh I organized for this July, next, next month, we're supposed to have a 35th year anniversary uh, and a reunion in, in July. And everybody, you know, we, in, in, in LA. Oh. We were gonna get a uh, hotel room and, and the guy who's in LA was gonna get us a studio to record an album 25 years later. And then COVID hit. Oh, darn it. That could be your second career. <laughs> So now we're now having a WhatsApp group and we yeah. share songs and we share old stories. So oh my God. it was fun. Like 35 years later, you know, yeah. it's like, it's like my wife told me if, if that's not a midlife crisis, I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> well, if plastic surgery doesn't work out, you can move on back to the songwriting. Good for Telling you. you. <laughs> so that's, well, thank so that's you it. so much for sharing. How can um, people learn more about you? Uh, I mean, I have my, um, uh, you know, my email is georgebitar at bitarinstitute.com. And uh, through our... And bitarinstitute.com uh, is the website. Now I'll tell uh, them. But, but my email is georgebitar at bitarinstitute.com. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, through our Instagram at the Bitar Institute on Instagram. I have my personal Instagram is Dr. George Bitar, but I keep it, you know, like for personal things. I don't put before and after photos and stuff. I just... Gotcha. And I never like to put my kids' pictures on Instagram. So people sometimes go on Instagram, they don't think I have kids, but I do, but I don't put them on Instagram. That's awkward. I, I need to do a podcast on that. Like, when is personal, wh what's the boundary there between personal and business, you know? Well, I mean, look, the, the, the bottom line is that the people, including the fans and the followers, they push you mm -hmm. to show pictures of kids. Mm -hmm. It's like almost like a very strong current that's, pushing in that direction and you have to resist because I've had a lot of people impersonating me on social media. And I, I mean, yeah, I, I even had a, a guy who basically, uh, I had a, I was like sitting in a coffee shop watching um, the, a world soccer like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy sitting next to me and my son and this guy who impersonated me said that, and I'm sitting with my two sons and he was trying to hit on some woman online and made it look like their two kids are my sons. and. And she had, oh I mean, God. crazy stories. So I'm like, oh and, yeah. and, and, and I didn't even post that picture. He, I don't know, he went and dug it somehow on the internet, but it's just very uh, unsettling. 
Uh, you know, fishing. Um, like I get a lot of crappy stuff because I think they think I'm um, the Nigerians, I guess. Is that who's doing it or whatever? They showed yeah, a this guy. This, this guy was like hitting on a woman and telling her he's yeah. Dr. Bitar. And she, she called our office. She said there was something wrong when this guy sends me the picture of a white guy, but he has an African accent. Right. So right. he was using my photo, but he was telling her that he lives in London, but yet he is, he has a practice in the, he's trying to impersonate me, but he lives in London. Wow. So crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And say well, hi to your wife for me. She I will. I will. She, uh, she loves you, Catherine. You know that. And she gives you her regards. And, you know, if there's anything else I can be of assistance, please reach out. Well, I will have you back for, because you have many facets to your uh, life and your practice. So I'll, we have all sorts of different topics to talk about. And with that, I'm going to call it a day. Um, I would love for you to subscribe to Beauty in the Biz. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review. If you have any comments or feedback, I'd love to hear them. Um, please just DM me at Catherine Maley MBA, or you can always leave me a message at my website, CatherineMaley.com. Catherine All right. Thanks so much. Talk to you again.